Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Aaron J. Young, and I've been super excited to have him come in because he's a really cool guy, and he's an absolutely amazing photographer. Say hi to everybody, Aaron. Hey, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thanks for coming in. I don't know where to start. I've got a couple notes on things we want to talk about, but why don't we just start with who you are? Where'd you grow up? What was your situation? And let's get a little background. Sure. Um, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, really like in the middle of cornfields, in the middle of the woods, basically. A small town. My hometown at the time, I think, had less than 500 people. Whoa, that is small. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those, it's one of those like small town places where like the, it's made up of a bunch of little towns, you know? Okay. Uh, uh, so a small town, my family was very religious. Our, our lives kind of centered around Christian religion. And I would say I kind of grew up in a bubble, you know, not just like geographically, but just, you know, with the religion. And uh, my parents decided to homeschool us kids when we were growing up. So, you know, so I never went to public school ever and uh, spent a lot of time at home. Uh, there, you were not an only child. No, so I have I have two other siblings that were at home, uh, also like doing homeschool, and then I had another uh, sibling that was uh, quite a bit older, like fifteen years older. So she was already you know married and moved out and everything. Okay, so it was it was three of us when I was growing up. So you were really sequestered, right? Very sequestered. Yeah. Yes. Very. I, I lived a very sheltered, I would say, childhood. Yeah. And I've always been a very creative person. You know, like 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 when I look back on my life, there's just a series of obsessions that I've gone through in my life. You know, like there's uh, the first one was drawing. Um, that was my first like creative endeavor okay. when I was really young. And then music. Um, in my teens. And did you then, sing or play an instrument or what? What was well, that? Well, it's I did. I did all of it, but I so I I had to go to church growing up. Like that was like you know many pretty much everything that i grew up around religiously was like non-negotiable it was just right. you know and your lives they're centered around all that yeah like when i see i i know like right now um i see, there's a lot of talk about you know like pushing the gay agenda onto people you know as like a talking point and you know i very much lived the life of having you know a religious agenda pushed on me my whole childhood um because i had to go to church i thought you know i'm gonna make the best of the situation so i actually started playing music at church and and like guitar or what? Guitar, sometimes a little piano. Um, huh. mo mostly guitar, though. So I was like a part of the worship band. And it was an interesting thing because I was not necessarily believing in the religion. Um, but I was like a part of it in that way, you know, a part of the services and w when I was doing the music. So you did drawing and then the music. And that was the, what was the next thing that came up? I guess the next, the next thing creatively, I think, was photography you was know it? and in between there were different things like there okay. were, you, that weren't creative so much like you know i was really young i loved catching frogs and snakes and turtles and <laughs> i was like obsessed with that and then uh you know somewhere in my like i think when i was 15 i started working out and then that became an obsession i became a personal trainer for a period of time and yeah i guess when i'm passionate about something i i, I become obsessed with it it's easy to become obsessed to learn a lot about it to like get good at it because i'm so interested in it and i spend so right. much time on it but like in school i was like if i'm not passionate about something which was most of school that I most of the things I had to learn it's very hard for me to actually learn because I just it's something about like focus and it's just it's really hard to focus it's when I'm just not passionate about the thing that I'm trying right. to to learn about I guess so were you homeschooled your entire like elementary middle and high school yeah I took I remember taking one art class at the public school that was like I guess a semester maybe where they were, we were doing like um sculpting I think and that's it so did that give you like a taste of the outside world or yeah I mean the thing was also I had all of my friends once I was in my teens were from the one high school that like we would have gone to my sister because it was a small town yeah and my, my sister <laughs> yeah. played a, a lot of sports and like soccer and track and she was really good and she actually played with those teams um so there was an element of like still being involved with the school in a way from a distance kind of is what it felt like to me okay because i wasn't directly involved with any of the pro like the stuff that my sister was so when did the great escape happen from the town oh so i well i always thought from about the age of 14 that i was going to move out of the, ho the house i grew up in move away from my family like the day i turned 18 did you tell them that 
Yeah, they, I don't think they took it took me seriously. So you talked um, about it, but it was like, oh yeah, I talked about yeah, it from yeah. time to time, but I don't right. think it. I don't think it was taken very seriously until I was, you know, maybe seventeen, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, he's serious. But I didn't actually leave right when I turned eighteen. I I think it was like closer to nineteen when I moved out for the first time. I basically we had this agreement that if I stayed once I turned eighteen, I was going to not have to answer to my parents anymore. And they had basic things that they asked for. They were like, you know don't bring any drugs into the house, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, like right. the basics, but like they were like, as far as just living your life, like do whatever you want. So they and, didn't make you go to church or no, that stopped that, probably, that expectation. Went away. Yeah. That was all okay. part of it. I was like, you know, I'm, you know, if that's going to be a part of the experience and I'm not sticking around for it since that all changed, then I stayed for, for a little while longer and then eventually moved out. And then it wasn't until I was maybe 22 that I actually moved to LA. So it was a couple of years where I was like still in Pennsylvania on my own kind of, or you well, know, did you stay in that town or did you go to another one? I moved to the nearest big town which was state college where penn state university is it's kind of where everything's a lot of stuff is happening you know so like when i got certified to be a trainer the gym was in state college that i worked at and my life basically was just in state college Uh how old were you when the photography started popping up uh about 21 22 okay so that's when you got serious about it well no that that's like when i first picked up a camera okay and then it was like something i wanted to do but it's a lot of years of just slowly figuring everything out and um, i also had a lot of fear starting like i had a huge i've always had a big uh, fear of failure and um it's always translated creatively so you know i when i look back i'm like there's a lot of time that i spent just not taking action in different areas of my life out of fear so you know it's been slow going at times and i guess we should pop in here you're gay correct i am gay yes when did all that fit into the narrative here i'm sure you know it's like you know it's something that's always kind of a part of your life right regardless did you, of did you know you were gay when you were younger or yeah it was just like a you know i mean everybody i pretty much ever met or talked to it's there's a period of time where it's like you're figuring that out and you're deny it, trying to deny it at least that was my experience you know especially growing up religiously. And you know, I was taught earlier than I could comprehend what I was being taught about heaven and hell and that type of stuff scared the shit out of me, you know, and then to, to layer on top of it, like feeling different in this way and trying so hard to be different, but not ever having any success. It was like the, the fear just kept growing and the shame kept growing. And when you moved out and went to the bigger town mm-hmm. <laughs> did that part of your life change as well i was closeted at the time okay. f- f- when that when i first moved out so i was still kind of moving through the world from that space of you know hiding a big part of who i was but i did right when i moved out i met my guy who became my first partner i don't i mean that period of my life for a few years is a little hazy because there was a lot going down and right. a lot of when i look back you know it was probably the most tumultuous time in my life of just like being a grown-up being out in the world being free and pretty much just operating from a total place of trauma and shame right. and self-hatred and you know making all kinds of choices that were just like self-harming and so so like the timeline of all that uh-huh. is a little right. it's a little hazy a little hazy I, I, it's, yeah it's always been a little hazy but i don't know i probably within a, a month or two of moving out i um I, we met, I met this, this man for the first time and, and then within maybe another couple of months we were dating seriously. He was in a relationship living with his partner and I was 19 at the time. He was 56. So Whoa. yeah, it was a big age difference, big, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, there's moments in your life where it's like you're just living whatever's going on. It doesn't seem like a big deal. But when I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, that interesting <laughs> yeah um yeah and that was like a very tumultuous relationship as well for a couple of years we ended up living together and that was my process of slowly coming out to my friends and coming out to my sister and then from there at some point was that the one that was the sister that was closer to your age not the older yes, or the yes, older one the sister that's closer to my age and then at some point i don't know how long we were together but at some point one night some shit went down and basically without getting into like a ton of details right uh my partner at the time had attempted suicide he had like left 
our place, our apartment, and had been found somewhere convulsing. And what we found out later was that he had taken a bunch of pills. He had, he had gone somewhere, taken a bunch of pills. Then I guess those started to take effect. And that's whenever he was found, luckily. And, you know, it was like four in the morning, I think. There was like a knock on my door and it was two cops and they were asking if, if he lived there. And then they gave me a ride to the hospital. And I arrived at the hospital just as he was arriving in the ambulance. And, so, you know, like the garage of the hospital well the cops were there fast then wow that is probably one of the most traumatic experiences of my life because you know i was 19 yeah to be i i was also very codependent you know the relationship was very codependent i was not okay on my own it was like you know i felt at that time like i really needed somebody to be okay and i had this whole fantasy of like what what a life with another man would look like and that it would be like the white picket fence kind of deal and and in, in some ways i know now that i was just also like part of what was driving that fantasy was just wanting to experience some things that i i just didn't experience growing up in my family you know so to, to have all that and then to one more morning at five o'clock I'm like in the hospital watching him be rolled by me like he's already on life support with his you know covered in blood like it was just like I had at that point I had only come out to a small handful of people so I didn't feel like I really had many people I could even like talk to about it Um, so your support system was really not there (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I didn't have a huge support. System. I had a couple of friends who who were great. Who yeah, I didn't have a big support system. And um, uh, did he make it? He made it. Okay. Um, but that was my coming out to my parents. Was uh, my sister? My sister was just I really worried about me. I think, and so she told my parents what was going on. It was a Sunday morning, and so I was in the ICU. Just you know, if I hadn't slept and I was crying, holding his hand, I think and my mom just showed up and she was like standing in the doorway. So, you know, there wasn't much that needed to be say, said, you know, because it was kind of pictures worth a thousand words. It was very obvious, I'm sure to her what was going on. So, and then my dad, once he was done teaching Sunday school, <laughs> he came and um, yeah. And that was my, my like official coming out to my parents. Did they talk about it after? I don't remember having many conversations about that experience but yeah i mean we had com- some conversations about just you know me being gay and, uh, are they out of the picture now or how, no no, no, how, no. i mean they... i i have the best relationship with my entire family that i've ever had now and oh, I would say it just continues to get improve as i continue to do my own personal work have they grown as well yeah i would say so from that point you said you earlier you moved to la what kind of a time gap was there in that that, is that, good... that happened in pennsylvania is that correct that happened in pennsylvania yeah, okay yeah. I can't remember how much longer we stayed together after that. Because it's Cause there's this weird mur- murky time where we broke <laughs> right. up, but we stayed living together. And like, honestly, when I think back on it, it doesn't actually make sense in my head even, like how right. things were unfolding, but I'm sure yeah. it made more sense then. But there was also a lot of, that was a period in my life where I probably was drinking the most. And I was even taking my partner's pill, because like, especially after that happened, he, he had some sort of pills that he was prescribed, or he always had like some sort of painkiller which is something i don't know what the fuck they were but i just took them you know there was a period of time where i was like snorting them and smoking a lot of pot and just kind of like intoxicated a lot and he also was i've never considered myself an addict i've always been able to just stop whenever you know go through phases of whatever and not go off the rails but i I think that he was an addict um but i didn't realize it at the time so there was that whole dynamic of you know like shit always going down whenever drinking was involved whenever we were both intoxicated and then it was like shit storm would ensue and so yeah it was just a that's why it's so hazy i think so what year did you move to um to la it was 2009 okay and Um, that was as a single man you went right yes okay as a single man why la I'd been starting to seriously think about it, like I, I, like in, intuitively. So this was, I've always been a very sensitive person, a very extremely intuitive person. But, right. you know, I, I back then I wouldn't say I was always really following it or knowing what that was. But at least in this area, I intuitively knew that I was meant to get out of the smaller town and be somewhere where there was more going on. And I just had a sense that there was, that I was meant to be doing something big with my life basically is all I can say. Like I didn't really have a clear picture of what that was, but it's just that knowingness was enough to kind of act on. So I thought about New York and I thought about LA and, um, I'd only been to the West coast a couple of times at that point. I just liked the vibe in on the West coast. I liked, had you visited before you actually moved there? Yeah. So when, when I was I think 15, okay. um, my family, we did, I think it was about three and a half week, uh, like road trip, field trip around the West coast. At the time I was 15 and I was just like hating everything and everyone. And 
I hated that I had to be there and, you right. know, and it was kind of miserable. But when I look back, I was like, you know, it was, that's actually a really cool thing to do, you know, to like travel around the entire West coast. And, you know, we right. saw Los Angeles and San Francisco and other States and a lot of national parks and things. So that was one time. And then I had visited with someone else like for a week in West Hollywood. But yeah, I mean, it just, New York just seemed like it was going to be too similar to where I grew up. Like I didn't want to deal with the cold and all that bullshit. I just wanted to, you know, right. have a complete change of. So the times you were there planted some seeds. California is a good place. I guess so. Yeah. I guess yeah. it kind of. And why LA? So for a brief moment, I thought Palm Springs. But when I was, the first time I was here, I think I was 21 maybe. And I remember just thinking like this place is like way too, too slow. slow. <laughs> like yeah. I don't understand how people live here. Like it's hot and people just like don't do anything. <laughs> that, right. that was my perspective at the time. Right. Now I really, probably have to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now, now I appreciate those things about here. Right. You know, that's why I, I love it. Yeah. Well, so mo- that, moving to LA though, that, I mean, that was, and you were how old? Uh, yeah. So I was 22, I believe when I, when I moved to LA, it's a big thing to do to, you know, grow up in a small town and then just decide you're going to up and leave and not really know what you're going to do too much when you get there. Was photography in the back of your mind at that point? It was. I was a personal trainer at the time. And so training and that kind of dual. Yeah. But I mean, photography was the very beginning stages of even picking up a camera. So I was, I had no clue how that could ever be turned into a successful career or how I could make any money at it really. So that was just kind of an off in the distance kind of hope or dream. And when I arrived pretty much immediately, it was a huge culture shock that I wasn't <laughs> expecting. Um, well, PA to LA, come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I was a child, like I always felt on some level, like an old soul and I always connected with people who were older than me. And so right. on some level I felt more like, you know, quote mature for my age, which I think sometimes is laughable now when I see 20 something year olds saying that, but you know, I understand that you can have that experience and also still very much be a kid in a lot of ways because you've only been alive on the planet for 20 years, you know, right. and that's an external thing, but I think there are old souls. I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I am some old... part of them that really does fit in. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think you can, you can have a kind of experience that's both of those things at once right. in a way, but the kid in me was terrified. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I was just, I immediately like got depressed. I immediately freaked out, thought that I made the wrong decision because of how scared I was when I was here. I kind of secluded myself for the first couple of months. I didn't do a whole lot. I wasn't very social. Just going anywhere was scary. I was scared I was going to like get lost to going to the grocery store or wherever. So were you working at all or did you have a little money saved up? Or I had, a little, I had a little money that I could live off of. So I didn't have to just like hit the ground running and try and jump into figure, out, okay. figure out like how I'm going to make work happen, Okay, which was great. It was like, it allowed me to kind of go through this process a little bit. And then by the time I was kind of figuring things out, I decided to go to massage school. And then I transitioned from doing personal training to doing massage. And luckily that was something that was fairly easy to get going. So I was fortunate to be able to make a decent amount of money while I was trying to figure out what the hell I was doing. Well, how long did life. the massage school take? About a year. Okay. I say. Were you doing training while you were to make money while you were going to massage school or how'd that work? Yeah. I mean, I didn't really tell many people that at the time that I was at massage school working as a massage therapist, but you know, <laughs> oh, you were working as a massage? Oh, yeah. I was already doing massage. Oh, I, was, you were doing I was already it. making money, but I was like, I need to go to massage school because I need to really okay. know All what right, I'm cool. doing, you know? All right, gotcha. Um, but uh, honestly, I was like, if I can already make money at this, like, wh- whatever, I'm just going to do it. I have no regrets about, <laughs> about that. I'm very grateful that it was something that allowed me to make enough money to right. really... Well, if you were a trainer, you understood muscles and stuff anyway, right? I mean, you had yeah. some Yeah, yeah, to some degree, it was, yeah. there's a crossover. Yeah, the saying, um, wherever you go, there you are, or something like that, right. it's very true. I was very much still the self-loathing, shame-based, just like scared little kid that I was in, in Pennsylvania. And now I'm just in a big city, terrified, still extremely codependent, looking right. for who my next partner would be that would save me from myself. But like also lacking kind of the awareness to, to understand that that's what I was doing at the time. I'm grateful for that because all of that, actually all of the misery eventually just led to therapy and led to um a whole journey now that's pretty much been my entire adult life since i was about 22 of just working on myself and through i mean i i re- that's another passion of mine that i kind of discovered early on like i really love psychology i love spirituality I find it all fascinating. So it was something that I really dove into when I just 
started going to therapy and you know my therapist gave me homework to do i would always do it and report back <laughs> it's like well you do everything 110 or 20 percent. but also so I, was, I was passionate about it and i <laughs> right. thought you know this all resonates like you know there's a possibility f- to have a different experience of life than what i've been having and i was like i'm fucking miserable you know i was really truly miserable and i don't know how people go until they're in their 40s or 50s without starting to work on themselves like i really don't know how some people do that because my misery just kept building to the point where I was like, I need to do something, you know, cause I don't want to live like this. I don't want to just have an existence where I'm obsessing over people and hating myself and always in my own way and constantly feeling like I'm just reacting to everything around me and it's terrified of everything and anxious about everything. And it was a lot that's kind of taken a huge like forefront in my life for, right. for the last, you know, uh, 15, 16 years of my life. So when did the photography really come into the picture? I mean, in a, in a big way. I would say when I, when, uh, again, I can't remember what year this was, but I, I had only been in LA for maybe two years or maybe even less, maybe a year and a half. One of the first, the first professional thing that I did as a photographer was I uh, was working with a friend who would go around to the gay clubs and would just photograph the nightlife, basically. And it was like the photos of the the, mag- the Frontiers magazine right, that used like, to exist. It's a kind of a social thing. Yeah, like towards Who's the back. And yeah, this is where towards they the back were. The magazine was always like, they did. Yeah. it was like, this is what happened last weekend right, right, kind right. of a thing. Right. It was those photos. Okay. So that was the first professional like photography gig that I had. And it was fun. I would have a lot more fun with it now because back then I was like very shy a lot more shy and a lot more shy. i felt so shy, socially awkward and i felt like i just like you know it felt like a, a struggle to like meet people and whatever um, but it was a great way to meet people to have a camera in your hand and you know to right. have that as your job so i did that for a little while and then that transitioned into working on rupaul's drag race as the stills photographer oh very and, cool yeah that was like the first like legit job that i had as a photographer right. and it happened so early on in my career that, you know, I was 100% not qualified to do it, but (laughs) I, (laughs) but when the opportunity came up, I knew that it didn't matter how scared I was or, you know, I had a whole long list of reasons why, like I shouldn't do it, but I just knew that like, this is not the kind of opportunity that just happens like this very often. So I knew I needed to, to just suck it up and say yes and figure it all out, which is what I did. I said, yes, so like took it on. And then I was like, okay, now I need to really learn how to use my camera. I didn't even fully know how to work my camera at that moment. So it was like a crash course in like, okay, you got to figure this shit out and you got to do it fast because you're going to show up on the set in a week. And <laughs> whoa, <laughs> you're making me feel the fear. <laughs> it was, it was a lot. I hadn't really yeah. been on, I had been on set a couple of times just, right. you know, like hanging out on set, but I had never done it like professionally. So I had no idea what I was doing and I wasn't even familiar with the TV show. Really. I wasn't that familiar with RuPaul. I knew who he was, but not really that well. I didn't, wasn't familiar with drag growing up in Pennsylvania. They didn't have drag at your church. No, they didn't. No. No. So yeah, but I just kind of threw myself into it and and it was great. I, I, I shared with a couple of people on set that I was kind of what the truth was that I was like, you know, kind of fresh to all this and they were great. They were, they were helpful and they were like, okay, well making sure that I was good and kind of showing me the ropes a little bit. Oh, very good. And then I got, I mean, it'd take too long to get used to it. And then I, I continued to do that for a couple of years to work on the show for a couple more seasons and the spinoffs and the like all stars and all the things that were a couple other things that were happening with them. But then I stopped working with them because I really wanted to get my own career going outside of that. Cause I knew, I knew that that I didn't want to be somebody who just went from show to show working on that because that's like a very all consuming kind of career when you work in television or in the movies it's like it just consumes your whole life like you're working all day every day that your social life becomes your work life like because that's who you're spending all your time with because when you're as soon as you wrap it's like i'm just exhausted i want to go to bed so that i'm rested for you know for tomorrow (laughs) the 16 hours tomorrow type thing and i was like i don't want that to be my life and I knew that, but I did enjoy, I, I enjoyed doing it for like chunks of time. So I made the decision to really like pursue my own independent career basically. So then it felt very much like I'm back to square one. Cause I was like, okay, I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing or how to make that happen. How um, did you make it happen? What'd you do? I just kind of kept showing up for the process really, you know, did you like get studio space to start or, or did no, you? I started shooting out of my bedroom. Like when I started shooting, I had a roommate. I just had a section of my bedroom that I would put a ba- like a paper backdrop up on the wall. And I even did like 
some paid shoots where clients would come to my bedroom <laughs> like and you know it was like i was charging hardly anything and it was that's how i kind of started and then I, from there i i moved into a small studio apartment and by the time i left that studio apartment i had cl- basically cleared out the living room and that was my studio and then from there i moved downtown to downtown la into a loft and that was the first time that i had like a space that felt more legit like it felt like okay yes i'm living here but it's a living it was it live works yeah, yeah and it was set up very perfectly perfectly to have right. a whole section that I considered my studio and it just felt better to have clients come there. And I mean, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's, I would say it's the passion that's kind of kept me going because there's been so much fear that I've had to overcome and continue to have to overcome that at the time was debilitating. And at times I confused it with a lack of passion. You know, there were times when I really was like, I don't know that I want to do this for a living. Like, I don't even know if I'm that passionate about it. Um, But what I recognize now is that was just an intense amount of fear. It wasn't that I was ever not passionate. It was just, I was just terrified of like, I don't know how to do this. Like, I don't know how I'm ever going to be successful at this because there's just so many unanswered questions I have about like, how do you have a successful business and how do people actually do it? I just kind of kept showing up for the process which, you know, early on that looked like, I remember one time making a list of people to photograph that I knew that I thought, okay, these might be good people to photograph. Some of them were recognizable people. Some of them were just interesting people or whatever. And I was like, I'm not going to get paid for it, but just to get the ball rolling, to build some momentum, to be creative, to build a portfolio. (laughs) I just kept showing up for the process really. And like, you know, slowly things started to come together at different times. And so, I was, I was, so you're primarily a, a portrait photographer now, correct? Correct, yeah. Every, okay. Pretty much everything that I do yeah. is photographing people. So RuPaul's experience kind of got you going with people, correct? Yeah, that, I mean, it was because that was all photographing people. It introduced me to the world of drag, which has turned into you know a decent size of part of my career. Do you still shoot drag stars or? I do. I mean, it's transitioned from like working on the show to doing my own projects. And I mean, I, I have gotten hired also by different queens or by right. you know to do like a magazine or whatever but at, from time to time but the bulk of photographing drag queens has been like my own personal project stuff okay. that i've done so you talked about moving through the fear what do you love about photography well with specifically with what i do so photographing people i love capturing energy that you can't actually see in a photograph that you feel when you look at the photograph like it's an interesting thing because what I'm trying to capture is it's actually something that you don't, you can't tangibly see. It's, it's, it's what you feel in, a, in another person. Like you can feel someone's energy. You can feel authenticity. You can feel the essence of who someone is. And that's what I'm always trying to have come through my photographs of my subjects, but do it in a visual through a visual medium. Right. And so I really like that aspect. I think that's really interesting. And I just, I like, I love the creativity of it. I do. I mean, I have like a love hate relationship with it where <laughs> it drives me crazy on a regular basis or, I drive, I, so. or I, I, it doesn't drive me crazy. I drive myself crazy. I mean, I'm a perfectionist. I'm very competitive in my own mind. So when I do something, it's like, I want to be the best. I want to like, you know, I want to be really good at what I do. And so if I, if I feel like I miss the mark at any given point, it sucks. And it's, which happens, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, current time of social media where there's this speed associated with creating content that is not realistic for i don't think any artist right. uh to just you have pump to just out. keep feeding the like, hungry lion <laughs> yeah like when you look at yeah. people like some of the most revered artists in the past you know centuries it's like they didn't operate that way you know they operated on their own timelines on completely different timelines it wasn't about just creating shit for the sake of creating shit so that you can stay relevant and stay in front of people and so that has really changed everything i think so i've gone on your website which is gorgeous (laughs) thank you i love it and a number of things uh just popped out at me so the first one was you photographed immigrants correct i did yes why did you do that tell that story where did you go and why at the time, my partner at the time, um, he is a journalist, was and still is, and he was working on a project with the uh, Weather Channel that was, the story was on how climate change is affecting prolonged drought in Central America and around the world, but they were focused on Central America and how prolonged drought is starting to lead to famine. And because of that, people are, I mean, that it was in 2017. So this was at the same time that 
the migrant caravan like phenomenon was happening in the news right. in the United States and Trump was the president. He was talking shit about them. Yeah, they were um, being demonized totally. Yeah. Yeah. So all of this was all kind of happening at right. the same time. Right. And so he was doing this, this story. And so the story was basically showing how these people are not just deciding like, Hey, I just want to live in America. Like right. it's a last resort that they are leaving their hometowns, leaving the places that they love packing up with their families or sometimes leaving their families, trying to find something better and then bring their families along. But it's like, like if you, you can imagine doing it at great risk. Yeah. Too. If you can yeah. imagine like living in our fucking sheltered lives that we live in America, that we're surrounded by comfort, even when you're, you know, struggling in your life comparatively still in a huge amount of surrounded by comfort right. and what it would take to actually uproot your entire life. You know, it would take a lot for me personally. So I wanted to just be a part of that in some way. And, um, so I thought the best way I could would be to just photograph those people and to just photograph them in a really honest way that would hopefully capture their humanity and authenticity. Where did you go to do that? Uh, so that trip, it was just to Tijuana because okay. it was, the, it was the last trip that, of the production that they were doing because they'd gone multiple times to film and the very last, they were following a, a couple of specific stories, a couple of people okay. at, on their journey. And so the final trip, they had made it to the border and there were a lot of people there and they were all figuring out what they were doing and they were going to, you know, some people were trying to uh, gain asylum. Some people were going to, I'm sure, try to cross illegally. Like there was all kinds of stuff going on. And, um, so I had, I was hired by the weather channel, but I had total creative freedom to do whatever I wanted. And so I just took a, Oh, so they hired you, the weather channel. Hired they did you. hire me. Yeah. Okay. But I, I mean, there was no parameters. I could do whatever I wanted. So I just went to while they were filming their things and I just put a backdrop up on the wall at a homeless shelter where they were filming. And it was interesting because it kind of turned into, uh, photographing a lot of children, which I was like going to just photograph everybody, but that just kind of organically happened. And I think that that's really powerful to show like how many kids, like little kids were there and had come with their, you know, right. their parents. And well, I think one of the images that stuck in my mind was, I believe it was a father probably tossing his kid in the air playing, playing with the kid. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they was... didn't look like rapists or killers in the photos I saw. <laughs> no, I mean, to be honest, I personally, I haven't spent a lot of time in Mexico, but the safest I felt, cause it's, you know, when you're like, I don't know when you're having lunch somewhere, at least for me and like a, you know, a truck drives by with, with like guys in military uniforms with machine guns, like it's a little uneasy. I feel a little uneasy. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. I don't feel the safest. I'm like, exactly. and then knowing because of my partner at the time, like he does a lot of work there and he knows what it's all about so he knows how infiltrated like the government is with the cartel and, and just knowing all of that is like it, i don't feel safe like i just didn't feel like a, a huge sense of safety there but when i was at the shelter and surrounded by these people i felt completely safe because everybody's just they were wonderful people they just wanted good lives for themselves and their families you know right. they wanted to survive and like they were uh they were very kind very welcoming i mean a lot of them were were surprisingly uh, positive and upbeat given what they've been through and what they are continuing to go through. And yeah, it was a really beautiful, you know, experience. And then we came back and then eventually right in the next year, I think that was towards the end of 2017. And then the beginning of 2018 turned it into an exhibit in LA. Um, I was going to ask you where that was. Cause it looked, it was a show obviously. So that was in LA. That was in LA. Yeah. How long did it run? Uh, for a month. What was the response? Uh, it, I think it got a, I think it got a good response. I think it was impactful. I think, you know, I think that it, from, from the people I talked to, you know, it, it had an impact on the people who went and saw it and experienced it. Right. You know? And then you worked with prisoners or former prisoners on another project. Yeah. So over the last two years, uh, the anti-recidivision coalition in, um, Los Angeles, they help, I mean, they do a whole bunch of things, but one of the things they do is they help people who or getting out of prison, like reacclimate into the, the, the world, you know, and a lot of people, you know, if you spend a lot of time in prison, then the world changes a lot while you're a there. Lot. And so yeah. it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people, you know, get out of prison and then they can easily end up back in prison, especially if there's no help to kind of navigate like what, what you're actually doing. You know, like I, I can't personally imagine how difficult that would be and how difficult I think it is to find work and to actually get things going and everything. So, so they helps a lot of people 
in that realm. So I did, uh, it started with a Father's Day project where we photographed a, a group of portraits that were fathers, formerly incarcerated fathers and their kids. So it was everything from fathers who had little children, you know, like newborns to fathers who had adult children and then their grandkids. You took these photos for this group. Is that the idea? Yeah, I, I took it. It was they, it was sort of like a Father's Day campaign sort okay. of thing that they rolled out on social media, and they it was really cool what they did. Like they they interviewed all of the fathers, and so the fathers were able to sort of tell a part of their story along with the photographs, which was really awesome. And then then the following year, it might have been this year actually or last year, then we did the same thing, but uh, for Mother's Day. Okay. So these were mothers who were in prison before. Yeah, formerly incarcerated mothers. And okay, their, and then their kids. And wow. it was cool. I mean, we've, we've chatted about, I, they've said that they would love to turn it into a book someday or, you know, which would mean, you know, doing more of it. We'd have to, you know, obviously photograph more people and stuff. Right. But yeah, I really love doing that kind of work where sort of giving a platform to people who don't normally have a platform and humanizing people and bringing dignity to people and sort of hopefully breaking the barriers of, you know, there's so many barriers, right. you know, based on how we judge each other. But I've always kind of found that to be more interesting than, you know, like just photographing a beautiful person because they're beautiful, you know, like that's never been that interesting to me. It's like, I find it much more interesting to capture somebody who's actually, who's been through something in their life, right. who's like overcome something or who's going through something or, right. or who just could benefit from having, from being seen, you know, in a way that they haven't before. That That's probably why. I loved your work so much because I, you know, I do photography as well. Mm -hmm. And I've said multiple times in my photography, my favorite thing would be when I can make people think and feel that that's what I want. And I, and I think I sensed a lot of the same type mm -hmm. of a thing in yours where, you know, you just don't want to take a picture of a pretty person and well, there it is. I mean, it's a right. great photo. Right. Well, I mean, if I do take a picture of a pretty person then there still has to be that connection coming through the photograph Where you're capturing you know? their really their essence yep. yeah beyond the the beauty even what what, what, what yeah, else like is if, there if, if i i mean i know when i'm capturing that thing because i feel it right and so if i'm not feeling it then those photos never see the light of day because really w without that i feel like that i think that is single-handedly the most important thing when it comes to portrait photographer because you can have the most beautifully technically lit styled everything photo but if of a person but if if if, if you don't feel connected to that person when you look at the photograph then for me the entire photograph falls flat and none of the other stuff really matters that right. much. You know, I would much rather capture a, a portrait where I can feel something, even if the technical aspects were lacking, you know, I think that would be more powerful right. than the other way around. Okay. So what else I saw on your site were your self portraits, right? Yeah. I thought that was, they were really great. I mean, people can't see them. We're going to put some links by the way, in the episode notes. So everyone can see all of Aaron's amazing work and there'll be a bio and stuff in there but uh we'll, we'll add that later but as far as the photos of yourself or a lot of them are nudes although they're not graphic so you're not really showing anything yeah i mean it's, so it's cutting down to the essence of who you are right but there's one that popped out at me and i have to ask you about that so and i'm sure you'll remember the, this image but in the image you're in it twice and you're you're on a stool on the left side and you're facing away you're facing to the left mm -hmm. in the in the image and you've got your hands behind you where they almost there's they're not tied but to me they look like they could be tied mm -hmm. then yeah. there's another you got some structure there where it's it it's like a wall where you coming over it with both hands mm -hmm. kind of reaching out to yourself that's the way i interpret it anyway yeah. so what was that all about i love that image well it's up for interpretation <laughs> for sure <laughs> well, I, obviously you want people to, to interpret it but yeah but I mean, why, why what, what caused you to do that if i remember i don't do this as much anymore just because I'm not as much in this place as I used to be, but I oftentimes would create self portraits out of pain. Okay. Either I was going through something in real time that was painful, like a breakup or something, or I was just getting in touch with, you know, the pain that I still had in me from childhood. Right. You know, and it's a really amazing outlet when 
you feel things really deeply and when like emotional things can feel debilitating when you have an outlet or a way to turn it into something that can be beautiful and feel like you're giving it meaning other right. than you know this experience just fucking sucks right. and sucks that i'm going through it and i feel like you know that's how i used to feel a lot of it just things would feel so overwhelming that when i was going through them that i was just like it's just like debilitating and then i would create something and so i think that photograph was probably born out of one of those moments was it your current self reaching back to your old self in some way or i'm trying to think i don't i don't know if i had a 100 percent clear idea of what i was trying to convey because oh. I, I knew it could be conveyed many different ways so i right and i liked that aspect of it but yeah i mean i think i i would say that 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 is a part of it for sure because i think the the journey i've always been on has been this journey of of reconnecting with my true self right because i think trauma and there's a lot of things in life that disconnect us from who we are and then i feel like it's just a journey of coming back to kind of rediscovering ourselves and developing a relationship with ourselves and um i do know at that time when i created that photo that i was feeling disconnected from myself especially compared to how i feel today so so i'm sure that's what it came out of it's just that okay that sort of experience i was having of disconnect and wishing that i did feel more connected to myself but but just not be just not being in that space you know well, it's a beautiful image, and I'm encouraging everybody that is listening to this to check out his site and check out his work because it's gorgeous. So we're at the point where I ask you, so you've lived your life thus far. What advice would you give people? What are some lessons that you've learned that you would want my listeners to hear? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question, but it's like, um, God, I don't know. Should I come up with a different question? The thing that makes it hard is like there isn't like one or two things that just like stand out to me as like the, you know... Okay, I have just one answer, I guess, just based on where I'm at today in my life. I see experience in the photography world, especially being around a lot of other photographers and a lot of people in different stages of careers and and different artists struggling, just struggling to kind of make shit happen the way that I've always been trying to make stuff happen. Right. And I believe what I've learned is that a lot of it is about just momentum, like just, just deciding every day to keep walking in the direction of your goals or the the life that you want, the things that you want, whether that's, you know, that can transcend through all different aspects right. of life. It can be career. It can be one day just wanting to be free of a debilitating anxiety or in working towards that. What I've experienced is that everything changes if you continue to show up for the process. And I think that that's a bigger aspect of success across the board than actually being good at something and actually just like having natural talent or, you know, just being like really good at what you do. I think the people who really succeed in life and in different areas are the ones that really just continue to show up for the process. Those people tend to get out ahead of everybody else. So show up. Yeah. And and hang in there. Give yourself grace to have the moments that feel defeating because that's part of life i think is to i've had so many days and weeks and even months feeling completely defeated in career wise creatively on a personal level relationship wise feeling like i'm incapable of having you know a good relationship or incapable of (laughs) all kinds of things and um yeah it's just you know as long as you you know it's okay to have that experience and to allow yourself to go through that it just, i think it's just important to at some point just know that you're continuing on your journey that that's not the end all be all that right. there, it's not like a, not giving up just because i'm just because today i'm like feeling completely defeated with my career you know like i'm gonna maybe put everything down and not do any work today and then tomorrow i'll pick it all up again and keep chugging along and <laughs> you know right. keep working towards right. my goals wow Good time with you. I enjoyed this. Yeah, it's a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, I um, really appreciate you coming in. Thank you. I for think we need me. to do it again sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be an interesting thing. Like, check back in in yeah, a year in. or two yeah. and see what's going on. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Thank you.